Senator Edward Kennedy addresses the people of Iowa. Good evening. In a few days, many of you here in Iowa will go to your precinct caucuses to renew the oldest tradition of our democracy. Here in this state, you'll begin the process of choosing a president in 1980. For the past nine weeks since I announced my candidacy, I've traveled 5,000 miles in Iowa. I've seen a lot of Iowa, and Iowa has seen a lot of me. I thought you'd have the opportunity to watch all the Democratic candidates in open debate, to hear and judge their views. I welcome the debate, even when I was far ahead in the polls. So tonight, I want to answer questions that would have been asked in the debate. Some of you have already heard me respond as I campaign, and many of you have not. There are Iowans who have large family responsibilities as I do. They asked me about that, about the personal burdens of running for president. Last year, over the course of several weeks, I discussed the decision with all the members of my family, with my wife Joan, with our daughter Cara, a sophomore in college, with our son Teddy, a freshman, and with Patrick, our youngest son, almost all of Jack's and Bobby's children, for whom I feel a special responsibility, are grown now. And throughout our family discussions, Joan urged me to become a candidate. We have visited Iowa together in recent days, and we have made many friends among the people of your state. Many of you are Democrats who ask a different question. Why did I choose to challenge an incumbent president of my own party? Why didn't I wait until 1984? I strongly supported Jimmy Carter in the last election. I hoped and expected that he would succeed as president. But by last year, it became increasingly clear to me that things were out of control and that America was losing ground at home and abroad. I knew that I could wait for the next four years, but I believe that America cannot risk four more years of economic disorder, international decline, with the nation adrift, buffeted by events, tossed like a cork on uncertain and stormy seas. It was the lesson of my life and the commitment of my public career that I could not stand by while this continued. I have had the privilege of seeing the presidency up close. I know its power. I know that the presidency is the one place capable of providing the purpose and direction for us as a people to reassert control over our national destiny. Good intentions alone are not enough. They will not prevail against the difficulties, the dangers, and the disorders of our time. A national election is the people's chance to take charge of their country. For an election is not merely a verdict on the past, but a vote for a vision of the future. And I believe that in the 1980s, we can master the dangers pressing in upon us from the wider world. I hear Iowans asking why American influence is falling everywhere. Why are our embassies are burned and our diplomats are held hostage? Why our credibility wanes with each crisis that erupts? American prestige is at its lowest point since we became a world power. Constantly, we seem to be reacting to the events that take us by surprise. Our foreign policy is so far out of control that the administration cut off grain sales to the Soviet Union after the fact of crisis. The painful irony is that we may have hurt American farmers far more than Soviet aggressors. We can confront the challenges before us, but not by lurching to the left or the right. The symbol on the great seal of the United States is not a hawk or a dove, but an eagle. And in one claw, the eagle holds the arrows of war, and in the other, the olive branch of peace. In the 1980s, we must be more realistic about potential threats and more ready for peaceful possibilities. We must work closely in cooperation with our friends. We must be firm against our foes. And we must not be fooled when the Soviets lie to us. We must deal with them on the basis of our national interest, whether we are drawing up an agreement to control arms or drawing a line against aggression. 
You also ask why we never see a crisis coming. We will not master events if we lack accurate intelligence about them. This is as true of Cuba and Nicaragua as it is of Iran and Afghanistan. The world must be sure and we must be certain that America can respond where its vital interests are at stake. This does not require spending for gold-plated weapons that we do not need. It does require that we strengthen our conventional forces. The Soviet Union moved 10,000 troops into Afghanistan in a matter of hours. Yet up to half of America's combat planes cannot fly. Up to half of our ships cannot sail. Only by increasing our strength can we reduce the risk that it will ever have to be deployed. In part, we are weak abroad because we are weak at home. When inflation rises from less than 5% in 1977 to over 13% today, when we import more oil now than we did three years ago, we inevitably become a nation held hostage to others. Ten years ago, we debated whether we had the right to determine the destiny of other countries. Today, we worry whether we can control our own. I think of that in human terms, of what it means to so many of you. In November, I visited Leonard Tracta, a farmer in Marion. He told me how he had saved money and bought a farm many years ago. He wonders why his children can't do it now. Today, farmers are being driven off the land. 2,000 family farms have been swept away from the soil of Iowa in the past year alone. I have also visited a senior citizen center at the First Christian Church in Des Moines. They asked me why a democratic administration wants to cut their social security. They told me they were making hard choices. Today, too many of the elderly are huddled in cold apartments, while a U.S. government pamphlet has the audacity to show them how to stay warm by tying bundles of newspapers around their arms and legs. For others of you, the American dream is fading. The dream to own your own home or send your child to college. The very promise of our history is faltering. The promise that each generation of Americans will pass on a better and greater country than they inherited. I believe we can master our economy. Workers across the state ask a simple question. Why their wage increases are held to 7% a year while the prices for everything they buy soar nearly twice as fast. Americans favor price and wage restraint, but we want the restraints to be fair. We had that confidence in the 1960s when vigorous presidential action kept inflation down. You remember that period. We had less inflation in an entire year than we presently suffer in a single month. Iowans also asked me, why would any Democratic president lift price controls on oil? Decontrol is an invitation to a decade of inflation. It will cost each of your families an average of $1,000 a year between now and 1990. In the next four years, we can stop the oil conglomerates from buying up other corporations and energy sources. They claim they need excessive profits to explore for oil. But do you know what the executives of Mobile Oil did with their profits? They purchased Montgomery Ward. I believe that in the 1980s, we must master our own energy future. This requires that we multiply the efficiency of our energy supply. Other countries do it, and so can we. Germany and Japan produce a ton of steel with 40% less energy than we do. I've offered a plan to modernize our industry and insulate our homes. It can cut our energy imports in half during this decade without telling Americans to be colder for their country. And it will cost only a fraction of the administration's big spending $88 billion program for untried synthetic fuels. People understand that government cannot spend its way out of the energy crisis. We ought to develop as synthetic fuels, but in a practical and prudent way. Nor need we rush to a nuclear future that may jeopardize the future itself. I disagree with the administration's decision to construct nuclear power plants in haste while safety questions are unresolved. 
Unless nuclear plants can be built safely, they should not be built at all. Abundant alternatives are all around us. We have 400 years of coal in the ground. It is our richest resource of this continent. And we can harness the endless energy of the sun, the common resource of all the earth. I have talked to hundreds of you who ask why we are not moving towards a solar economy now. Has America lost its technological genius? This is where flight was invented and the atom was split. From here, humanity stepped into the void of space and left footprints in the valleys of the moon. What is missing now is not the skill, but the will to reach for a brighter energy future. In the 1980s, we dare not risk a government that tells us what we cannot do. We must demand a government that challenges us to do better. Finally, I believe we can master the injustices of our society. In 1976, a Democratic candidate here in Iowa called the federal tax code a disgrace to the human race. In 1978, the disgrace was deepened. The so-called tax reform legislation of that year provided only token tax relief for middle-income Americans, but thousands of dollars for the richest people in the country. I know that we can change our tax system, despite the power of special interest. I fought hard in the Senate to repeal the oil depletion allowance, and we did. In the years ahead, we can end the tax discrimination that penalizes working men and women when they marry. We can close down the tax shelters that make a mockery of our tax laws. There are other issues of basic justice. Iowa is proud of its place as a state to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. But not a single state has ratified that amendment in the three years this administration has been in office. The next president must demand fairness for all those to whom life has been unfair, for the majority who are women and for the minority who are not white. My fellow citizens, we all know the difficulties of this decade will test the old values and traditions that are at the heart of American democracy. Victory for those values will depend upon new approaches. The problems will not yield to ideologies, but only to ideas. In the 1980s, we do not need a government that always does more or that everywhere does less. What we need is a government that does better. This election offers each of you the chance to choose. We can prolong the passive present. We can repeat the past and risk a continued drift from bad to worse. Or we can strive to meet the future with a renewed sense of confidence and commitment. That has always been the American choice. And it'll be the choice in Iowa on January 21st and the choice for the nation next November. I'm grateful for the way Iowa has welcomed me and the members of my family into your homes and communities. I seek your help and your support in the caucuses on January 21st. Your votes will be the first voice heard in the great decision of 1980. From the heartland of America, you can speak for the kind of country you want America to be. I'm Tom Miller, Attorney General of Iowa. With me tonight are some other Iowans here to discuss our reactions to Senator Kennedy's speech and his candidacy and the importance of the January 21st Iowa caucuses. Doug Thompson from Goodell. Clara Olson from Iowa City. Representative Lowell Norlin of Kensett. Betsy Birmingham from Marion. And Connie Birmingham, also from Marion. Frank Alexander from Waterloo, and Rachel Fulton from Waterloo. We've heard a clear, concise statement of, of why Senator Kennedy is running tonight. Uh, we've seen him in our state six out of the last seven days. He's campaigned extensively in December and early January uh, in our state. And I think we do have a good understanding now of, of why Senator Kennedy is running and, and what this election, uh, election, election means. Lowell, what, uh, what reaction did you have to the, the speech tonight? Well, the reaction comes through very strongly tonight that, that this country can do better. 
the fact that uh, I think if you talk with the people around and your neighbors and friends, why, they're nervous. They don't really know what tomorrow's going to bring. They've got high inflation, high interest rates, question about energy. Uh, and I think people want to know that this country can still do the job, that, that with good leadership. And I think Senator Kennedy's that man that to provide some leadership to move this country ahead and, and to do better. I, I really like that idea. That I made my decision rather early last summer because um, I felt that our domestic policies were not being addressed, that the president had had ample time to speak to these areas, and um, we weren't receiving any positive policies. I think the senator has answered some of these questions this evening in the area of inflation, on changes that could be made. And I hope that people that are out there that feel the Iranian crisis and the crisis in Afghanistan do not allow us to um, go against our incumbent president can kind of think a bit further. And we do need changes. Our domestic policies and have to be addressed. And once our crisis is settled, that these problems will still be with us. And I think Senator Kennedy can best address these problems. I think, you know, what he touched on was uh, sort of three intangibles that, that we do need, and that is hope, confidence, and sacrifice. Uh, hope about our own personal lives and, and how they're going to be in the 80s. Uh, some, some confidence uh, about our role in the world and some sacrifice on our part. Um, I don't think that we should ever underestimate the, uh, the ability of the American people um, to sacrifice. If there's a good reason uh, to do that and a strong call for that kind of sacrifice, and that's what I really uh, was, I think, most impressed with, sort of those, that intangible qualities that, uh, that he was uh, talking about and calling for. Well, doesn't he impress you as a person that understands the use of power? All right, that is not blaming the victim, for example, in the energy matter and saying, put on another sweater, but is, one anticipates, able to call in the oil companies and say, you will be accountable. You will pursue certain policies. And I think that's one of the real lacks of Carter. I just don't feel he's a good negotiator. I mean, if he speaks to the head of the oil companies the way he speaks to the American public on TV, I would go out and do exactly what they did. Take the decontrol of oil and just laugh all the way to the bank. Why should I do anything different? And I think that that's one of the things that Kennedy communicates. And one of the things that I liked about tonight's speech is that he gives you a sense of his mettle. All right. Um, he's come into the state many, many times, spoken to many, many different people. Um, we've learned a little bit more about Massachusetts. He's learned a little bit more about Iowa. Um, it's been an enjoyable and an educational time. All right? he's, put, he's made himself accountable, which is one of the things you do when you have power, which Carter has not done. And those particular issues are the kinds of issues that I'm interested in. And, and I'm, if I can't have a woman president, then let me have a man president that understands <laughs> about power and for whom is to be used in this country. And I don't get that sense with Carter. I think we have to look at uh, the candidacy of Senator Kennedy in a, in a, in a, in a way that uh, we've got vision looking into the 80s again. Uh, myself as a farmer, I know uh, when President Carter was elected back in 76, we thought that we had ourselves a friend in uh, the White House at that point in time. And since that time, we've had commodity credit corporation loans cut for the purpose of promoting exports overseas, not to say nothing of the uh, embargo against the Russian grain. Uh, the farmers of Iowa are acutely aware of what's happening in their own personal lives. Uh, for example, we've got interest rates which uh, are going to be above 14, maybe 15 percent. And these are going to be short-term credit, maybe 90 days at my local bank. And, and we're looking at high energy costs. And I, in reviewing my own personal uh, financial records uh, in preparation for the IRS, uh, noticed that my interest bill and my energy bill were together equaling about 25 percent of my gross income as a farmer. And that is a staggering amount. I think we can look to the 80s for Senator uh, Kennedy to provide us, uh, probably not cure our ills as uh, 
we're going to have to bite the bullet. We're going to have to have some own per, uh, some personal sacrifices. But I think there is there is hope there. Where there's some vision that we can look forward to. And I'm I'm so enthusiastic about the senator, and uh, I wish this was a year from now and he would be our president because I'd feel so much more comfortable. Well, the American dream is, I think, perhaps considered an old fantasy by Americans, but it's, it's been very real, I think, in almost all of our lives as we've been growing up. You expect that uh, certain things will happen. You'll have opportunity to make your life perhaps better than your parents' lives. My husband and I looked for our dream by uh, operating a small business and a small farm. And over the last few years, the opportunity to realize the dream, I think, has just declined substantially. Everything costs more. Uh, we got our bill for fuel yesterday. It was almost $100 more than the highest it had been last year. Uh, that's a substantial amount to people with a modest income. So when I was watching Senator Kennedy this evening, I couldn't help but think that if he'd been sitting with me in our home and we'd been talking about issues, we would have talked about the very same things together that he mentioned tonight. Inflation, energy, those aren't academic issues. Those are very real issues that, that cut into our lives in very personal ways. We have a young, growing family. Our children are going to be going to college beginning next year. And we're, I think, just now beginning to get a real sense of what that's going to, to do to our dream. Um, we'll probably not retire as early as we thought we would, if at all. We'll continue to farm and operate our small business just to pay bills. It isn't a matter, I think, of, of wanting a fantasy to come true. It's a matter of wanting to live with some dignity and of feeling that our participation in process matters. I think Senator Kennedy offers us that possibility to be part of not an easy future, but a possible and dignified future as individual citizens and as part of all of the country. Well, the senator touched on this one issue tonight that uh, I guess was one of probably one of the first issues that uh, invited me to withdraw my support from the president and to uh, support Senator Kennedy. And that is the senator's history of true concern for people with um, less ability to fend for themselves uh, people who are on fixed income, elderly, uh, people who, who do not have good jobs or even without jobs at all. And I think that the senator uh, does have a vision and is able to, uh, to look down the road into the future of America and determine uh, how these people should be taken care of. And um, I just don't believe that the president has that vision, or at least he hasn't shown it to me yet. I, for one, was, was very disappointed that the president uh, withdrew from the debate and uh, denied Iowans the opportunity uh, to see the three major candidates uh, up close and uh, to see them uh, uh, challenged by, uh, by Iowans and by, by Iowa problems. Um, I think we've lost a lot in, in not having that opportunity. But I think Senator Kennedy tonight did the next best thing. That he answered those questions that I've heard people ask about, uh, about him and his candidacy about the family. Um, I think that, uh, that it's not well known. Uh, the great role he's played in that whole Kennedy family, uh, that he's been a substitute father for the President's Kennedy's sons uh, and daughter, uh, and for Bobby's children, uh, that, uh, that he's been a real leader uh, within his own family. I think that uh, a lot of Iowans have had on their mind, uh, uh, why is he running now and not waiting until 1984, uh, which probably made more political sense, would have been more politically expedient. I think he answered that question about uh, uh, that we can't wait, uh, that the crisis is, is in the front half of the 1980s, not, uh, not, in, the, not in the last half. And I liked uh, his discussion of, of energy. I think that, uh, that energy, uh, unlike uh, hopefully Iran, Afghanistan, uh, those problems I think are going to hopefully go away in a short period of time. But energy is going to be with us as a problem uh, throughout the whole next decade. And I think that, that the Sen Senator Kennedy is willing to, to face the tough questions on energy uh, and more importantly make us, the American people, face those questions and make some sacrifices. I think he, of all the candidates, is best able uh, to mobilize the American people around a program of sacrifice, uh, if need be, in the energy area and in other areas, uh, inflation. And I think that's why uh, um, 
he does present a strong candidacy. And I think a good part of that uh, came through tonight uh, in his talk. And I, when mm -hmm. people are interested in issues, mm -hmm. I think there's no denying that, that they are right. interested in issues in their future. And I think of especially the young people who are going to have their first opportunity to participate in caucuses this year, high school seniors, uh, they probably won't have had a chance to meet uh, the president. Most of them, if they've been interested enough, could have met Senator Kennedy any number of times. And do you think this will affect the way high school students feel about, uh, about the caucuses? Well, I think it will because you can really only vote it and attend your caucuses and decide on who you're going to support on what you have seen. And if you don't know where a person stands, we don't really know where President Carter stands right now on a lot of things, especially the people who are just starting to get involved right now. He's, all we hear about anymore is Iran and Afghanistan. And so we don't know about the issues that are really going to affect us in the future. I know right now, I think I would be afraid to have children within the next 10 years if the present trends continue. You can't afford to educate your children and maybe not even feed and house them, especially with interest rates and inflation the way they are. I think that it's an important thing for people to realize that their, their views can be known and they can express their choice of who they want to see for candidates. Uh, the caucus in, on January 21st is the most important thing that people should be considering doing on that evening. You know, if you've never been to a caucus before, you can go to your caucus on the 21st. Right. Kennedy needs and wants new people involved in the process. And the way you do that is when the, shortly after the caucus starts at 8 o'clock on, on the 21st, the caucus goers will break into to various groups and you vote for Senator Kennedy uh, by going into his group, much the same as you vote for a candidate uh, in the voting booth uh, on a primary election or a general election. And it's, uh, it's really that simple if, if, if that's the kind of involvement uh, people want. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of people who have told me that they, well, prior to the debate, they told me that they would make up their mind after the debate. And since then, they have told me that, well, gee, they were really waiting for the debate to make up their mind. But now they're confused and some of them quite angry. I hope, I hope our, our visit tonight and, and the, and the yes, senator's speech tonight is, uh, you know, will we'll help them make up their mind and, and make a good decision, make an informed decision. Right. I, don't, I don't think Iowans take this very lightly. I don't. And I think I speak for all of us when I say thank you to Senator Kennedy for taking this time to, to answer the questions that are on the minds of Iowans. We hope to see all of you at your caucuses next Monday night, the 21st at 8 o'clock. Good night. If you feel, like many of your fellow Iowans, that in the 1980s America deserves new Democratic leadership, join the Kennedy campaign. Send your contribution in any amount to Kennedy for President, Court Avenue, Des Moines, Iowa. It can make the difference. Kennedy for President, Court Avenue, Des Moines, Iowa. Thank you.